Okay, we are going to continue our conference now. And our next guest, John Dabash and Ricardo Luca Conti, they arrived uh, here with the help of the company La Force Passine. And they are going to tell us today how they managed to create a non for profit organization in London. And they focus on working with socially disadvantaged groups of people. We will talk about where they find financing and ideas and just the moral strength to keep doing what they do. So, John, Ricardo, the floor is yours. Please welcome. Hi everyone, so first of all, thanks for the invitation, uh, we're really happy to be here. Um, so today we're going to talk uh, a little bit about our story and how and why we decided to set up as a non for profit uh, design studio. And, um, and then we're going to talk about our approach um, and then we're going to give uh, um, an example of two projects, um, one that we completed in 2016 and then a most uh, recent project. So Catalytic Action actually started um, as an idea. Uh, it was me, Joanna, and another colleague from University College London. And what we wanted to do and understand was uh, how architecture uh, can be used as a tool to empower communities. And in particular, in our work, we were looking at vulnerable communities. So we had this idea, but uh, how then do you translate this idea into practice? So what we uh, did was to work with uh, local partners and other experts, uh, in particular we were working in Lebanon, uh, to understand the specific needs that were present uh, in the context where we were working, and we also worked with the local community to understand even further these needs. And then it was our role as architects and designers to try to translate these needs uh, into design solutions that could answer uh, the specificities of the context. So uh, Lebanon is a very small country in the Middle East uh, for who doesn't know it. Um, it hosts a high number of Syrian refugees who fled the war in the neighboring Syria since the 2011, when the Syrian civil war started. As a Lebanese and Syrian, I saw the impact of displacement on the communities and on the built environment. Syrian refugees in Lebanon, a high number of them, live in informal tented settlements. So basically tents, as you see in the picture here, and when we visited a number of these informal tented settlements with our local partners, we saw the very urgent need for children to have spaces, safe spaces to play and to grow. In order to understand the specific needs of the children, we conducted the participatory assessment, as you see in the first picture, where we hear from the children about their aspiration and their visions. And we also did lots of observation of the existing play practices. So as Ricardo said, we were just like freshly graduating from our master's degree in the University College of London. And we, the only way to, to fund for this project was to create a crowdfunding campaign that we launched uh, online. And uh, we successfully uh, managed to collect uh, the, the amounts in order to be able to build the project. It was really uh, happened just because of the support of many people who believe that all children have the right to play. Once we collected the money, we uh, moved to the con community engaged construction phase that happened with the local people and with the children themselves who saw the project from its inception to its completion. As you see here, children participated in different activities such as painting, whatever was safe for them to participate, such as painting, planting, creating seating, and uh, the result was Next. 
The result was uh, a playground that served more than 300 children and is still functioning until today. And we named the project Iftasim, which means in Arabic, smile. So the most important impact for us was seeing these children in a very uh, like engaging and safe environment. And just seeing them smile was like a really important impact for us. Okay, so that was briefly the story of our first project. And um, so after we completed it, luckily it was a successful project and uh, was being published and we were receiving more requests to do more projects uh, from other NGOs working in Lebanon. And so at that point we felt it was necessary to define better who we were and who we are today. Um, and so define what approach do we want to use for the future projects and also what values do we want to follow uh, in all the projects that were upcoming. So firstly, the approach that we define is um, made by three phases. So there was a, a participatory planning phase that we also did in the, in the pilot project in which the community is highly involved and we do a set of exercises to understand the aspirations and the needs of the community. And then there is a sustainable design phase, which is, you know, like more the design phase that we all know. Um, and then the community engaged construction, where we involve the community in the building process. And these phases are not like a linear process. Sometimes we go back to another phase. So let's say we're doing design. We come up with some ideas, but we still feel we want to test these ideas with the community. So we will go back to the community, do another participatory assessment, and see the reaction of the community, and then either confirm the design or adjust it accordingly. And um, as I mentioned, we also developed a set of values that are really important. Um, so these values are uh, revealing and valorizing community knowledge, culture, needs, visions, aspirations, and skills, uh, transferring context-appropriate technology, skills, and innovative design solutions, supporting local businesses by prioritizing the use of local materials and labor, transferring participatory tools for this just decision-making processes, generating livelihood opportunities, and enabling uh, equal engagement. Um, so we're going to see these values uh, basically implemented in practice in the, in the projects that we're going to present today. Uh, some will be clear to spot, others maybe a bit less, but they're all there in our projects. So the first project we're going to talk about is a project that was completed in 2016. So the year after we completed the pilot project, uh, we had the great opportunity to work on a school project this time. And um, oh, it doesn't show much. <laughs> uh, so the story of this project actually started uh, in Milano, in, uh, at the Expo of Milan in 2015, uh, where Save the Children had a pavilion. And uh, after the Expo was over, Save the Children decided that they want to reuse the materials uh, for a humanitarian purpose. Um, so. The project is, is really like a um, result of multiple partnerships. So there was, on one side, Save the Children wanted to donate the materials. Uh, then we were working with a local partner in Lebanon who runs educational programs for Syrian refugees. So they were also in, involved in the project. And we worked with Arup uh, engineering firm to uh, do the engineering part of, of, of the project. So, all the materials coming from, from the expo in Milan uh, were packed into two containers and they were shipped to, to Lebanon. And as soon as they arrived on site, um, the site was uh, located inside a, a, a tented uh, settlement. Um, so it was really in close pro proximity where people live. Um, and as soon as the containers arrived, uh, everybody was really excited, children and also uh, parents and, and adults. Uh, they were really excited to see what was going on, and as soon as they knew that they were able to participate in the construction, they were even more excited. And so we started uh, this uh, construction process with the community, and you know we were unpacking everything, assessing the materials that we received from Italy, and starting this repurposing process of 
making uh, this structure be, become a school, basically. So in, um, in Italy, obviously, the, the structure was a pavilion, so it was an exhibition space, it was open, it had no walls, so obviously it wasn't ready to just be a rebuilt as such and be a school. So there was a lot of work that we had to do um, in designing the structure with Arup, as I said before, to make it safe for the new uh, use, and also a lot of uh, design choices we had to make uh, for the materials that were going to form the walls of the school, um, and, and also we had to create a new spatial configuration. Uh, so we had to rearrange these units that you see in this image uh, to create a space that was adequate to, for the school and for the specific needs that teachers and children identified during the participatory assessment phase. So the construction uh, took a few months, and uh, the, as I said, the local community was really involved in the process, and they were really happy to work on it, um, even sometimes working very late at night and also sharing uh, moments with us uh, even beyond the work. And for example, um, this is a picture from a wedding that took place in the settlement wh while we were constructing the school and we were invited to attend, of course, and also we had to help a little bit uh, to build like a, like a stage for the ceremony. So that, that's also a bit part of the work that we do. And uh, it was really fascinating to see how children uh, were perceiving the work that we were doing. So this is a drawing from, from a young girl who was living right next to the site uh, in, in a tent uh, that was just on the edge of the construction site. And she was drawing every day what was going on in the site, and it's really fascinating to see how she's uh, picturing the construction. But what's really important also to see in this drawing is that she would really like appreciate every single person that was building the school, um, whether they were like people she knew from the community or volunteers that were coming, or us uh, from, from the organization. And uh, as I said, all the people who built it were hired from the, from the local community, from the settlement. And uh, we did this uh, also through a sort of uh, training program that we wanted to do. Uh, so we hired skilled labor, so people who already knew how to build, as well as youth who maybe didn't have a lot of experience in construction, but they wanted to learn. And so by pairing up uh, basically skilled and unskilled, we also created this sort of training program that uh, at the end of the project basically represents uh, a livelihood for the youth who participated in the construction. And so after four months, we finally completed the building. And uh, as soon as we opened, the school was already running at full capacity, uh, providing education and safe learning spaces for around 350 children. So we always follow up on the school and we keep improving, adding and changing as the needs change uh, of the school, of the students, of the teachers. We have like uh, a sort of family in the settlement because of the time we spend there, about the relationships we created, and we always visit and hear from them. And uh, what's really nice about this project is that for most of the people who helped build it, it became a source of pride. It became their school. They really protected. And uh, here, Yusuf, who is a father from the Jarahi settlement, he's originally from Homs in Syria. He said that the school gave them hope for a better future for their children because it was uh, uh, built uh, by the community and it, pre it created a good learning environment for them. What is also very interesting about this project is the choice of materials that we had to use to build the school. Uh, the school is located in the Beka Valley, which is a uh, main agricultural land in Lebanon. And uh, in the winter, it's extremely cold and uh, harsh uh, with snows. And in the summer, it's very hot and dry. So a very important design feature was uh, insulation. and. Uh, 
and uh, what kind of insulation did we want to use. So we decided to use a sheep wool as insulation material. The reason we chose that is because uh, farms are mainly located in this area, uh, sheep farms. Uh, it is locally available. Uh, it is, has great insulation properties and it is known as a traditional material. Women already knew how to clean the wool, but they used to use it to fill mattresses or pillows. So the process of creating uh, sheep wool as insulation included another step, which is uh, the innovation that we brought to this material, which is how to treat it in order to become uh, protected from insects. So the last, really the last part. And with this, we were able to hire women who in this context was usually are not uh, engaging in any construction site. So in, in this project, in, in most of our projects, we always try to engage women who also join us on construction sites. Also view the limited budget uh, of the project, uh, we were using a lot of materials that were in the pavilion for decorative purposes. We used them in the school for really important and vital uses, such as the corrugated iron sheet that became a rain screen that's really important for the protection of the OSB and the insulation. And uh, we also used uh, locally sourced materials, but we used them in a different use from the original function, such as the grain bags fabric that's usually used to pack wheat grains, but we used it in this case to uh, pack the sheep wool in the roof of the, of the school. So as a result, uh, we have a very well insulated classroom that's naturally lit naturally ventilated, allowing a good learning environment, and it is the only safe space of its kind in the settlement, which allowed other NGOs that want to work in this informal settlements to use it for other activities, such as distribution of aid, doing yoga classes with the children, teaching English for young uh, kids. Yeah. Okay, so what did we learn from this project? Um, especially if we look at it from the whole process that led to the implementation of the school. Uh, what we learn is that, I mean, a very important lesson is that it's possible to reuse um, temporary structures for like new purposes, so whether this is a humanitarian purpose because an actor like Save the Children wanted to do that or you can use it locally for cultural facilities, whatever, but it's possible to reuse it and it's economically feasible also to do that. And, uh, and with this project, we also, when we looked back at it, we also realized that we were addressing a lot of the sustainable development goals, which is obviously something that we look at because we are a charity, a non-for-profit, so uh, we look at this, uh, these uh, things, but also I think architecture in general should look at, this, uh, at, at these uh, goals. And um, in 2017, this project was awarded the Lafarge Olsim Award. Um, and uh, like it won the award because it was clearly addressing uh, all the uh, target issues that the award looks at, uh, which are progress, people, uh, planet, prosperity, and place. And so when we talk about sustainable construction and sustainability, we're talking not just about the building itself, but we're talking about uh, also all the aspects that we mentioned. So the people, the program, as well as the design and the choices that you make in the design process. So like Joanna explained really well, when you choose insulation, how do you choose it? There are so many aspects that you can uh, touch by choosing just one single material. So, so really sustainability goes beyond the architect's presence. So like what's happening to the building after and what did you generate with that building? Okay, I'd like to conclude with uh, our recently completed project that's implemented in uh, Bereliers. Uh, it's called the Participatory Spatial Intervention. And uh, 
Bariliis is a, is a town also in the Bika Valley of Lebanon, but that hosts a very high number of uh, displaced communities, Palestinian and recently uh, Syrians. What is unique about this project is that we were able to engage with the local community through a very thorough and long process of participation uh, to develop the design brief that, that they were able to develop it themselves and to participate in the shaping of their built environment. We recruited and trained together with the University College London a group of seven local researchers that are from the different communities living in the town that are Palestinian, Syrian and Lebanese. We trained them on how to, be, how to do research. We trained them how to research the infrastructure needs and problems as well as the vulnerabilities of the different communities living in the town. And together with their own communities, they developed a design brief that would address their needs and their aspirations. The site of intervention was chosen as a public social infrastructure. It was the entrance road to the town. It was the only place where all communities use it. And uh, the design was uh, a series of small intervention that stretched from the beginning of the road till, uh, till the end uh, in order to make it more accessible, more child-friendly and safe. For example, this is one key location that uh, the locals found important to, to intervene. Uh, as you see, the sidewalk is covered by cars, and um, here you have a very uh, busy uh, health uh, center, uh, polyclinic. Um, so it was very unsafe for people to, to access the polyclinic. We transformed it into a pedestrian-only uh, space with a main shading area and a seating area. Uh, and um, we included the uh, playful features, uh, as you see in the bench, as well as floor games uh, for kids to uh, engage with. We also worked on the accessibility of the, of the sidewalks, which in some locations were as high as 60 centimeters. So by adding access ramp alone on all of the sidewalks, we were able to make uh, the whole road more inclusive, allowing persons uh, who use a wheelchair, as well as mothers with strollers and elderly to use the sidewalk in a more safe, uh, and in a more safe way. Also, the locals found really important to add signage in order to highlight very important uh, areas for them in the town. We collaborated with uh, two young local artists, uh, young women, who added mosaics on top of all of the seatings uh, that were in the town, and we used the uh, discarded ceramic tiles in order to do that. We also partnered with a, a cycling activist to create the mural that all the community participated in painting, but also encouraging people to use um, more bicycles. And with the municipality, as you see in the other picture, we managed to highlight a very key location to add speed bumps in order to reduce the, the speed uh, on the road. In this example, we uh, wanted to tackle the issue of pollution and waste, and it is a very big issue in the town, and obviously with the small uh, interventions, we weren't able to tackle it uh, fully, but we were at least able to raise awareness on the importance of recycling. Uh, as you see in this shade, uh, this shade is made of uh, uh, plastics that were of uh, shampoo bottles or any other containers that the people themselves collected and they cut and then they installed in order to make the shade. We have other shades using different other recycled materials. And uh, to conclude with, we really learned that architecture is not just simply about building, but it's also about process and community empowerment. And as it is provocatively stated by Giancarlo De Carlo, architecture has become too important to be left for architects. And I'd like to close by saying that uh, the, there's a Lafarge Wholesome Awards uh, entries are open and uh, we do encourage uh, all of you young architects that are listening to us today to really apply because it, it really meant a lot for us as a small and young uh, practice uh, to get uh, their really prestigious acknowledgement and yes thank you so much for listening. <laughs>